This is Alita Finella from Golder Associates, and I'll be presenting on the topic of exploring the hydraulic fracture stimulation patterns at the Forge Reservoir using multiple stochastic DFN realizations and variable stress conditions, as well as introducing um, how we developed the discrete fracture network model for Forge. This presentation was originally given on May 20th for the Forge Modeling and Simulation Forum, but the audio was lost from that live presentation, so this is a re-recording. I'd like to acknowledge the co-author for this work, Rob Pogorny from the Idaho National Labs, and previous co-authors uh, who helped develop the DFN were Brian Forbes, previously from EGI, and Hai Huang, um, previously at Idaho National Labs, who helped develop the workflow from taking a 3D DFN and moving it to the 2D arena. And as always, we um, are very grateful for our funding from the Department of Energy. And um, also the uh, other other partners for the Utah Forge site. As I mentioned, um, I'll first go over how we developed the discrete fracture network model. And that's a model of the natural fractures that we expect to be present in the Forge Reservoir. And then I'll, I'll lead into how this DFN is a useful tool for other modelers and how we hope to, to um, share that with other people. Moving on to specifically the topic that was in the title, we um, then exercise this DFN and look for um, the sensitivity of the discrete fracture network model with respect to actually hydraulic fracture stimulation in a particular scenario. And also we're trying to answer the question of, well, um, how much does the particular DFN you choose matter as far as um, which particular random number seed you start out with when you're generating the DFN and how much variability can we expect due to uncertainties in what we know about the regional stress conditions. As you as you know, the forge site, um, the plan is to develop a geothermal reservoir in a granitic bedrock. And one of the challenges in this situation is the need to create more permeability in this host rock. The uh, bulk rock permeability is estimated to be only about 48 microdarcies from the well test that had been performed in the pilot well. And uh, in order to extract heat from this site, we need to both add, increase the permeability so we can actually inject water in one well and, and pull it out of another production well. It needs to be able to flow between those two wells. And what I don't mention here in this in this uh, slide is that we also need to increase the fracture area um, so that the flow paths are are reaching a sufficient volume of that reservoir in order to extract the heat needed. So those those are two dual tasks that need to happen. This work will be focusing sort of on this initial permeability creation. On the left of this slide, we show the location of the forge site. It's in southwestern Utah. Um, and on the right, I show a schematic version of a DFN model. So uh, DFN stands for discrete fracture network. What we're doing is we're we're making a representation of the fractures in the rock. So in order to uh, in order to show these, we're, we're representing the fractures as our objects, not as the voids in the rock space, but we're we're showing them as 3D um, objects. Well, they're 2D planar objects in 3D space. And we're describing these fractures in terms of their spatial pattern. So we need to have some idea as to how these fractures are distributed um, in size, in orientation, shape, and intensity. And then once we sort of have this description, we'd also like to calibrate the model and give those fractures some hydraulic properties, such as giving them an aperture 
and an effective permeability plus uh, fracture compressibility, or we can also describe them using transmissivity and storativity. So those are those are properties we'd like to ascribe to these fractures that we we expect to be present in the granitic rock. All right, so first I'll dive into how we developed this DFN model. This was work uh, described in the Stanford Geothermal Workshop in 2019. There's a paper reference here. This is also available from, from the FORGE site. And um, the idea behind building your DFN is you want to capture as much information you have about these fractures in the system as possible. So from the pilot well that exists in the site, that's well 5832, we do have um, a very good FMI log which shows the positions of fractures in that well log as well as their orientation. Uh, what we don't know about the fractures that are, we intersect are their exact size or shape, so we need to assume those. But for whatever information we have about this model, we do want to incorporate that. So um, when we build our DFN, we'll have two components to this. We'll, we'll divide up the fractures into what we call a deterministic fracture set. Those are ones where we know the, the positions of, and so for fractures intersecting the well, we'll, we'll put those in the deterministic fracture set. But for fractures away from that well control, we'll put those in what's called a stochastic fracture set, where their uh, position and orientation, as well as their size and shape, are randomly distributed. So for the orientations of that stochastic set, we do have um, more information. So we have the information from the FMI log, which is shown in the larger stereonet here. That's an upper hemisphere stereonet of the fracture poles. And um, the contours have already been weighted, um, given a Terzaghi weighting, so that the bias introduced from the uh, relative orientations of the borehole and the fractures are already taken into account. And what we see from that stereonet, we we see that there's um, three main fracture sets. There's an east-west striking and subvertical one with this uh, fracture pole here. So the strike would be east-west. We see the north-south striking and moderately dipping, moderately west dipping. And we also see a northeast-southwest striking and steeply inclined dipping set. So we're, we're fortunate in that the host rock at the Utah site outcrops in the nearby mineral mountains and there has been extensive outcrop studies done in those mountains where we have um, measured orientations for fractures at those outcrops as well as uh, trace length maps. So choosing sort of the four most representative sites closest, closest to the forge site you can see the orientation of the uh, fractures mapped at those sites um, for the, the sites of the Pinnacle Pass South, the Negro Mag Canyon, Salt Cove, and the Bailey Spring South. And you'll see that these uh, orientations are not exactly the same as what we see in the forge site, but they're very similar. Um, where we do see um, approximately three sites, three fracture sets in those. And they're similar enough that we can get some confidence that when we look at the size measurements, that um, the sizes measured from those trace length will be applicable in our site as well. But we'll use um, we'll use just the orientation pattern from the uh, the FMI log to to describe the orientations in the forge site in our in our reference DFN model. As I said, um, we have those outcrop trace length measurements. Here's a map, I believe this one's Salt Cove. And um, we can measure the lengths of these traces and plot them on this log log plot where we're looking at sort of a complementary cumulative number versus trace length. So we're just um, counting up the fractures at different sizes and plotting them on this log log plot. And so we have the four different outcrops shown in the different colors here. And um, where we see linear slopes on a log log plot, that's showing uh, 
a power log size relationship of the fractures and it's generally what we expect whenever you're doing any kind of mapping however you do tend to see truncation at both the small and large ends at a certain point you're not capturing the smallest fractures so those are undercounted and similarly oftentimes you you don't have a wide enough area to capture the largest size population you're just not going to see them in your outcrop area so those tend to be undercounted as well so um, looking sort of at the center parts of these plots and looking for the linear ones, you can you can determine based on the slope of this line what the power law relationship should be. And all these outcrops aren't matching the same line, but they're, they're showing a range of slopes um, of power law distributions having exponents ranging from 2.3 to 2.9. So we chose an average value of 2.6 for the forage site. And we, we're also truncating the fracture sizes uh, in our DFN so um, that we have a minimum fracture radius of 10 meters and a maximum radius of 150 meters. As far as the intensity, we'll use the information that we got from the FMI data at the pilot well. And in this plot where we're showing a cumulative fracture intensity plot of um, measured depth versus the percent of total fractures measured. Plot um, linear linear plots on on this on this diagram show areas of sort of constant fracture intensity and the reservoir. Begins at this measured depth approximately of uh, one kilometer. And for the first 300 meters, it has a higher fracture intensity and then in the deeper portions of the reservoir, we're seeing this steeper line here which corresponds to a lower fracture intensity. So um, we'll just use the fracture intensities measured from that FMI log in our model. Now, um, the intensity you measure uh, in an FMI is usually you count the number of fractures per uh, interval length. So that gives you what's called a P10 value, the number of fractures per length. And we do a correction for orientation to convert those to um, a P32 value, which is not, which should not be biased by orientation. So um, doing that conversion, we come up with a P32 value for the shallow zone and the deeper zone, which we'll use in our model. So once we have the geometric properties of these fractures, so we have the orientations, we have um, sizes, size populations, we have intensity, then we can go ahead and generate our DFN and do some hydraulic calibration to determine what we want to assign for fracture apertures, compressibility and permeability. And given the fracture population that we've generated, so given the um, the size population we have and the truncations we've introduced, we then solve for uh, what should the apertures be to be consistent with what we know about the bulk rock porosity. So um, from the neutron porosity log, we have an estimated rock porosity of only one to two percent down in this deeper portion of the reservoir. And uh, we're assuming of that about uh, half a percent is due to the fracture porosity. So we assume a relationship between aperture and and fracture size. And we'll use it. Um, we'll use one saying that aperture is proportional to the square root of fracture size in this case. Um, and that would be uh, we're, we're, we're thinking there about sort of a hydraulic aperture of the aperture available for for fluid to flow through. And then we can just solve for this coefficient A. Um, once we upscale our our DFN, we can sort of solve for we, we assign it's an iterative process. We assign it some apertures based on this relationship, um, just assuming a particular uh, proportionality constant A. We upscale it to actually solve for what the fracture porosity is in the bulk rock given that assumption, and then we correct again it for this uh, proportionally constant A until we have a match between the apertures that we've assigned to those fractures and the upscaled bulk porosity. For the fracture compressibility, we um, 
can solve that note with some information about the the rocks uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So um, we can solve for bulk compressibility and then back calculate based on the porosity we've measured how to get to a fracture compressibility as shown here. And for the fracture permeability, we do a similar procedure as we did for aperture where we'll actually assume a relationship between aperture and permeability shown here. And then we'll just guess a proportionally constant B, upscale the rock and um, see what the what the bulk rock permeability turns out to be and then adjust the proportionality constant B until we get a match. This just gives us a um, consistent discrete fracture network model. So that given given our assumptions as to the fracture geometry, the hydraulic properties are consistent with what's measured. All right, so now I'm going to sort of transition into um, how we might be able to use this DFN. When we generate these DFNs in a region, uh, we get millions, millions of fractures in our model. And we'd like to, you know, we'd like to be able to hand over these natural fractures to other modeling teams so that they can run their simulations using a starting starting representation for the natural fractures. Um, most people don't want millions of fractures. Um, if you're doing uh, highly detailed full physics numerical models, you might only want uh, tens to hundreds of fractures or perhaps thousands, but probably not millions. Um, so we take different subsets of our DFN to, to share with other researchers. And what subset we take depends on what the modeling question is. So um, when you're using a DFN, you need to consider the region that you're looking at. Uh, is it the full region of the forge model? Are you really interested in a region near the pilot well 5832? And uh, the difference between these sort of regions uh, is you can you can take you can take into account much smaller fracture sizes if you're doing uh, say a near well study, you might be interested in fracture sizes going down to one meter radius as opposed to if you're doing the full region, you can't you can't handle that many fractures. You have different cutoff sizes for what your minimum radius should be. So that's an important question that you have to answer when deciding, you know, how you're going to use the DFN or what what kind of DFN you want to use. And then um, if you're modeling in three dimensions, you you might want a certain subset of the fractures versus if you're measuring in only two dimensions, you you might have different requirements. So these these DFNs can be filtered based on their location, their size, also um, sort of the the relationship between their orientation and the regional stress field, which which describes how easy they might be to slip or dilate under enhanced pore pressure during stimulation. So we can we can filter them by orientation or perhaps just take random percentages if that's appropriate for your modeling modeling region. And um, once you decide on the fractures, we, we also have to think about what format we'll be sharing those fractures with. These fractures were generated using the um, FRACMAN software package, and that has a sort of a default file formats uh, file format of fab fab files but we can also export them as point data or um, go cat services and uh, various other ones so depending on your needs they can be exported in different ways and then for continual models you might not want the actual the actual um, discrete fractures but you might want the the region's upscaled properties so we can give give you uh, things like porosity and directional permeability that you can feed into your models. Once we take the DFN and upscale it into some kind of a grid and the resolution that we would upscale that to would depend on your on your modeling needs. So that's sort of the general description of, of the forge reference DFN. We took that and um, and asked the question, well, Depending on on your modeling question, what you have when you, when you when you have a DFN, you're describing it in terms of a general population of sizes and intensities. 
We don't have information about spe specific fracture orientations and locations except for a long well control. So except for that pilot well. But how much variability would we expect given the particular random number seed we started out with for generating those stochastic fractures? How much variability are we expecting given that random number? And um, and also what kind of variability would we expect in that DFN for other other unknowns? What, what is the sensitivity of that DFN? So um, we have we have one question we've addressed here. So we're thinking, you know, what questions do we have at the forge site? What is the extent of stimulation is one? So um, in the sense that what we're shown here is a proposed new well 16A, which uh, is vertical in this section and then has a lateral section dipping pretty steeply off to the east here and has would have about a 60 meter open hole toe section here. So you might ask the question, if we stimulated at the toe here, how far would that stimulation extend and will we perhaps exceed the borders of our forge footprint? And can we answer that question with one DFN realization or do we have to care about the particular stochastic realization you've created given given your particular random number seed? The other questions are, you know, what is the expected micro seismic response? Uh, will the stimulations, as I said, exceed the property boundaries? There's many, many questions you can ask, but for many of the questions you ask, you might want to start out with a representation of your natural fracture system. You know, in this top down view for this particular realization, um, we can show sort of given two different, two different natural fracture systems. Will it look like this? You know, will you have if th these are stimulated fractures coming extending down at the toe here? Will it look here where it's well? Uh, it's it's restricted to the forge footprint, or are we would we be stimulating many many other more fractures, and would we perhaps be exceeding the footprint in others? So. I'll go into this example of the hydraulic fracturing at the toe of this new well 16A. And as I said, we've got a description of our DFN. Um, here, here we have the, our intensity description, orientation, size distribution, as I've discussed, minimum size, maximum size. Shape, we're considering the fracture shapes to be regular polygons with six sides. This is sort of equivalent to a, a circular fracture. Um, these are the apertures and permeabilities and compressibilities, but how much variation in modeling results is due to the particular DFN realization used? We want to answer that question. And um, to do that, I used um, the hydraulic fracturing module in, in the FRACMAN software suite. What you're seeing here is a side view of the forge site. Here's the ground surface up here. So this um, sloping just a little bit up to the west. Oh, I'm sorry, up to the east towards the mineral mountains. And here's that well 16A, which goes down vertically here and then extends laterally towards the east. In green here, this is the top of the granitoid basement. It's alluvial fill above there. So when we're creating our DFN, we're only concerned as to the fractures created in this ho in this host reservoir rock here in the in the granitoid basement. So we don't we don't include any fractures in the alluvium there. And we also show the existing well, the pilot well that we have the FMI data for 5832. It's mostly vertical well in this location. So for this uh, for the simulation. We're we're going to be doing stimulating this open open um, hole section here at the toe, and we're generating our DFN. Our region, our generation region, is it's this cube, uh, 1,200 meter box here, and we're really examining the hydraulic stimulation in this 800 meter box. So that's that's what we'll be talking about, is the results in this 800 meter box. To set up the hydraulic fracturing simulation in FRACMAN, I list here all the parameters that 
that go into that. And this this slide deck is available for your download, so you can look at these in more detail. Um, we're pumping for two hours at a pumping rate of 50 kilograms a second and assigning a, a delta pressure at the injection point of um, about a thousand PSI. That's not so important since we're not really solving for how you know how the pressure um, is is actually distributed in this system. The way the Frackman does this this um, sort of simplified simulation is given these pumping durations and this pumping rate. There's a certain volume of of water in this case that needs to be partitioned into both the existing natural fractures as well as a new induced hydraulic fracture. And so given given the these this fracture set that we have, given their connections, um, how can you uh, appropriate that volume of fluid a, in a time stepping fashion that's most appropriate given the stress conditions and their orientation? So um, we sort of have this simplified hydraulic fracturing simulation where we can create a large number of DFN realizations. So starting out with different uh, random number seeds, we create a bunch of different DFN realizations. So um, they're all described the same way with the same population of sizes and locations, but each realization has uh, different fractures intersecting that well at different orientations and sizes. So for each of those DFN realizations, we'll go ahead and run a simplified hydraulic fracture simulation, and then we'll measure our parameter of interest and compare the results. And this way, we just want to see what's the variability due to those different stochastic realizations. Um, what we're looking for here is sort of qualitative results, given the simplifications that we do for this this particular simulations. We we do expect to um, we're, we are including all the full, you know, the full million fractures in this in this simulation. We don't need to we don't need to have a subset. We can we can look at them all with their realistic orientations, intensities and and especially their connectivity in three dimensions. And we should be getting a pretty good response to the increase in pore pressure in those connected fractures based on their orientation and size. So we're 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 expecting to know which of these fractures will tend to inflate first, which will be susceptible to shear failure, um, and those which would be stable given, given the pore pressures and the regional stresses. Um, and given all our, our, all our numbers, we do expect to be able to identify which of, which of these DFN realizations show perhaps an average behavior versus um, more extreme behaviors. So, um, if we were going to pick one DFN to hand over to another researcher, could we give them an average performing one or would they want one that would show sort of more extreme behavior? We can identify those realizations based on this hydraulic fracture sim stimulation that we're doing right on the toe of 16A. So what we're not doing with this with this modeling work is we can't pull out, we're not going to be able to get the absolute values for the for the some of these measurements, such as the actual stimulation distance. We're getting we're going to get relative distances. We're not going to get an actual distance of, say, um, 800 meters or 700 meters. We're going to get this. This DFN realization uh, gives you larger extents than this other one. And um, by the same way, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't use this work to to try to evaluate how localized stress variations affect fracture response. So when I mean the localized stress variations, so stress shadowing, we're not including in here. Um, uh, we're not including how the actual presence of these fractures is affecting the local stress uh, environment. So um, it would be inappropriate to use these results to study that. And then other things such as, you know, actually understanding how much the apertures inflate or how the pressure dissipates with with uh, distance along these fractures. Those are inputs in this simulation. They're not outputs, so you wouldn't you wouldn't use that for this. But as I said, we we should be. This is the question we really want to know is is. Um, is real, can we identify uh, which DFNs and how much variability we would expect from the stochastic realizations? Okay. 
this um this slide goes into a little more detail about um, what we're doing in in the fragment simulation in order to decide which which fractures will tend to slip and which will inflate and which will be stable. So what you're seeing up here are upper hemisphere fracture pole stereo nets. Um, where you can't see it here, but I'm going to look at one particular fracture. It's right. It's it's a vertical fracture. Uh, with an east west strike, so the pole is right here close to um, close to this point. And just I'm just using this as an example. And then the colors on these stereo net indicate the slip tendency and the dilation tendency over here where the red colors um, indicate orientations that would be close to failure and the blue colors would be very stable. So um, in this example for this particular fracture, we show the Mohr circle here where the fracture sort of plots here on the Mohr circle. It's a vertical one and it's showing that it's it's actually pretty stable. Um, we can we can calculate the effective normal stress on it and then also uh, the pressure needed to cause slip. So this would be the pressure required to cause dilation. This would be the pressure required to cause slip and um, and when we're doing the hydraulic fracture simulation in FRACMEN, for all the fractures in the system, as they experience an increase in pore pressure, um, we do a more Coulomb evaluation to see how likely are they are to slip and dilate. And those that will dilate, we, um, we add fluid to, so we can increase the volume, we increase their apertures, they inflate. And those that would not inflate, but would tend to slip, we just, uh, we just mark those and and keep track of which ones those are, but they don't they're not accepting fluid. The ones that dilate are the ones taking fluid and um, we call those inflated fractures. And it's showing here vertical fractures aligned with the maximum horizontal stress direction of north 25 east up here. So ones striking this way would be the easiest to dilate. So those are the ones that we're expecting to take most of the fluid would be those vertical fractures with this orientation. All right, so what gets measured in each of these run? This is a top view of our system where you have our well 16A and this is showing the lateral extension of that well with the toe being right here. And um, we go ahead and, and run a simulation given a particular DFN and highlight which fractures accept fluid, which ones dilate. Those are the inflated fractures and also which ones will slip. And we just put boxes around them. So for the ones that inflate, we're putting the smaller box A, B and measuring the extension, the stimulation extents of A and B, how 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 far in the east west direction um, is that box and how far in the north south direction is that box as well as the vertical extension. I'm not showing in this top down view, but we are measuring we are measuring the vertical extent of these fractures as well. And then we do that for the ones that might experience shear failure too, and those are usually in a in a larger region, and we measure those again in the three cardinal directions there. So um, and then I have in this blue box here, I say the measured distances that I'm going to be showing in the results. They're, I'm going to be displaying them as normalized values based on the size of the hydraulic simulation region box length. So uh, the region box length was 100 meters. I'm going to be showing the stimulation extents as percentages of that box and not as actual measurements like 300 meters or 400 meters. Again, this is just due to the fact that we're getting qualitative results at, Given, this, given the assumptions we've put into this simulation, we're not expecting to be able to know exactly the quantitative results. So I'm just putting them as rel sort of uh, relative to the box size, how, how big these extents are. All right, so the results of this work uh, were published in the Stanford Geothermal Workshop uh, just this last year in this paper here, the references here. And um, that that paper is available from our website too. All right. So 
I'm first going to go over, we did 100 different stochastic realizations, so 100 different versions of that DFN, and we picked sort of the most likely regional stress conditions. There is some uncertainty there, but for this first part, um, we chose the most likely stress conditions and did 100 different realizations. And in these, um, in these plots here, I'm showing the count, like how many, um, So of, of those 100, the, it's the count of how many, you know, <clears throat> it's just um, the count of how many uh, of the DFN realizations sort of had normalized distances in these percentages. So looking at the three differences, three, three different directions here, we have um, east-west in this column, north-south in this column, and vertical in this column. And we're looking at both the inflated fracture distance. These are the fractures that are taking fluid. So the inflated ones are in purple down here. And if we include both the inflated and those that would fail in shear, we're looking at bigger boxes. We're showing the box sizes up here um, in these histograms. So um, what you're seeing is for the east-west distances, they're sort of in the range of um, you know, 20, 28 to 38 percent with a sort of a peak here around 30 to 30, <clears throat> 32 percent. Um, with larger distances in the north south, div um, north south direction, and north south is very similar to the vertical distance. For so, for these 100, 100 different runs that we did, so it's um, 100 different DFNs. What you know what kind of uh, variability are we seeing in these stimulated distances versus the um, just the different stochastic DFN that we choose. So we can look at it, it this way. Um, I'm also plotting them here in box plots. It just turns out to be a little bit more compact way to show the same information where um, here again, we have east-west extents, north-south extents, and vertical extents, and you can see the same patterns. So the, the purple here is inflated fractures, and the blue is both inflated and hydrosheared, so we call those the stimulated extents. So um, for inflated, they show the same pattern from east-west, north-south to vertical for both these sets, uh, where the east-west is a smaller stimulated distance than the north-south and the vertical. I'm also showing um, the median values with the orange lines and um, the whiskers here. So you're seeing the quartile values. So the um, first quartile, second quartile, third and fourth here with, um, with the whiskers extending to the minimum and maximum of the value. So I'm not taking like 95th percentile here. You're seeing actually the the absolute minimum value and maximum value of those of those 100 realizations. And I'll be using these box plots quite a lot in in the later slides. So for this this first run where we just did uh, under the most likely stress conditions, um, we, we can make a few conclusions to answer some of the questions we had where we see that hydro shearing occurs over a much larger volume than simple fracture inflation, which is expected. Um, East-West stimulation distances are smaller than North-South or vertical stimulation distances. And um, now here's where I get interesting is the variation between the stochastic realizations is quite significant and can lead to differences where minimum values can be half of the maximum value seen. So what we're seeing here is the particular DFN realization is making a difference for this particular question. So um, if you only if you only have the capability to 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 do uh, one or two simulations of this hydraulic fracturing simulation, you want to make sure that the starting DFN that you use to represent your natural fractures. Um, that you understand what it is. Is this would this uh, be sort of an average case or or an end member case? So it matters. That was that was a big uh, takeaway from this work, and also that the vertical extents show a wider range of values compared to the other dimensions. So the whiskers for this vertical, both the vertical, both for the inflated fractures and the 
all the stimulated fractures. The extent here is much larger. There's much more variability in that vertical extent than there is in the extent for east-west. So it's more of a concern if, if you're trying to answer the question of how far these are extending vertically. So it matters. All right. We did want to also address the question because uh, the regional stress is still not not pinned down precisely for the forge site. Will it matter what we use for the boundary regional stress conditions as far as which DFN we might want to pick, which realization would be an average one? So we did a sensitivity study on this, and this is in the same paper um, in that in this year's uh, Stanford Geothermal Workshop in 2021. So how much does that stress state matter? Um, the FORGE team measured the stress gradients from multiple injection tests, and that's presented in the paper Zing et al. 2020. That's a Stanford paper too. And um, tests were conducted in 2017 and also 2019 in um, a couple different zones in the pilot well and you can see that there is some uncertainty in what those stress gradients are and also as far as the orientation of sh max if you look at the the fmi well log you can see that there is some scatter there where the most likely uh position is sort of this north 25 degrees east azimuth however you know there is this this variability that we'd want to make sure we understood how that would affect the results if if that, you know, if the actual conditions in the reservoir were slightly different from what we think is the most likely. So um, this table here shows the different choices we chose for examining sort of end case members of the stress sensitivity. We have good ideas about what the pore pressure and the vertical stress is in the system, so we're not we're not doing any uh, sensitivity to those. But for SH max, we we have sort of this recommended stress gradient of 21.3 megapascals per kilometer, um, and then we're taking given the given the normal stress state of the forge. Uh, uh, forge site, we're taking sort of a pretty big range for minimum and maximum values. This SH max is not is not very well constrained, so we're taking sort of a, a pretty wide range of values there. For SH min, we've got a recommended value and we've got a minimum. Um, we're pretty sure we don't need to to go higher than our recommended, so we're only looking at two cases there. And the direction of SH max, we have our most likely orientation and then we do plus and minus 15 degrees corresponding to 10 degrees and 40 degrees on this chart as well. So with these um, with these different uh, parameters, we're, we're testing all the permutations of those possibilities. So we have, you know, three for orientation, three for SH max and two for SH min. So there's 18 permutations of that. So for each of those possible stress state permutations, we did um, 30 DFN realizations. And we did the same, we, we created, we did it in this order. We created 30 DFN stochastic realizations, and then we, we examined them. We did a hydraulic fracturing simulation on each of them 18 times. So with 18 different um, stress states, uh, leading to about 540 different, different simulations. And that's why showing um, the results on this box plot here is a uh, is a lot more convenient because I can show all the results on this one chart. Um, pretty, pretty compactly on the bottom are the different stress states. And um, so there's 18 of them down here and the labels are showing uh, the permutation based on the orientation first and then the the value of SH max, whether that's recommended or the maximum or minimum value, and then the value of SH min, where it's um, either the recommended or the minimum value. There's only two options there. And the ordering of these, you'll see in some of the following following plots, the ordering is, is done, they're ordered by the median value of the results. 
So the order can change depending on whether you're looking at the results from um, the vertical, say the vertical stimulation extents, or if you're looking at, say, the east-west stimulation extents, these the ordering might might change. But in all of them, I um, I outline the most likely stress conditions here. That's north 25 east with the recommended um, SH max and the recommended SH min. So here's here's the results we have for our recommended one. Uh, recommended stress state. And so when we when we plot all these 18 different stress states together, um, where you're seeing the variation due to the stochastic realization in the extent of the whiskers, but then you're seeing the difference between the different stress states by looking at the different columns here. The colors I've put here, I've colored them by the minimum um, up, I've colored them by the SH min. So we've got a minimum and the recommended. We've got those two choices here. So blue is the minimum SH min as opposed to green is the recommended SH min. And you can see that for this vertical stimulation extends that um, SH min is quite important that the variation in the vertical extent due to the choice of SH min, the gradient in SH min is greater than that due to the choice of the particular DFN realization. So the particular DFN realization here, you've got this range, but um, but the difference between these two sets is, is even bigger. So that's an important realization that really, we really would like to spend a more time pinning down this SH min gradient because it's going to have a, a very big effect on the simulations that are looking at um, hydraulically fracturing the toe of that well. In this slide, um, we're seeing that same plot again of the vertical stimulation extents, as well as the east-west stimulation extents and the north-south stimulation extents. And again, just note that the order of the stress states gets changed. It's they're ordered by the median value, so um, they can be different from plot to plot. But once again, the most likely stress conditions are outlined in gray for each of them. And then just what we can say by looking at this, I think um, it's a lot of information and I would refer you to the paper if you want to spend more time understanding these patterns. But the stimulation extents in all directions are significantly affected by the value of SH min with a couple of exceptions. And um, the variation in extents due to the SH min is greater than that um, due to the DFN realization. And those patterns were true in, in all the directions. In the next slide, we're, we're plotting the data in a, just a slightly different way. We're looking more at the anisotropy, so we're just highlighting the difference between the different directions of stimulation, so um, how far the stimulation extended in the east-west direction versus the north-south. We compare in this top one, so that's sort of comparing the difference in, in the lateral directions. And then on the bottom here, we show the difference between stimulation in east-west versus vertical and stimulation in the north-south direction versus vertical, where um, if they were the same, they would plot sort of on this uh, ratio of, of one here, which is the dotted blue line. And um, And here, um, this is just to sort of tease out again the anisotropy in the system, which is which is going to be a very important question in terms of determining how closely spaced you might want these um, these different um, stimulation zones in the in the well. So um, I say in the bottom two figures, the data can be divided into two groups those stress conditions with median ratios plotting below the 1.0 line where the lateral stimulation distance is less than the vertical stimulation distance and those that plot above. So the only three stress conditions that cause the lateral distance to exceed the vertical distance, there were only three of three of the stress conditions and they weren't the, um, wasn't the recommended values, but um, just these three sort of are special cases. So um, depending on what what uh, boundary conditions you use for the stress conditions, you might see slightly different behavior over here, but but these are all behaving very similarly. 
And um, again, the coloring was done based on the SH min values, and you're not seeing you're not seeing the patterns really dividing up by blue and green here. So there's not a strong pattern evident with SH min value as far as how that affects the anisotropy in the system. This is the same data here where the um, the coloring has just been changed instead of instead of plate um, plotting the colors by SH min, we use the uh, the direction of SH max to define the colors. So we have uh, north 10 east in blue, north 25 east, the recommended one in green, and north 40 east in purple. And um, here I'm saying while it looks like there's a strong pattern based on the SH max value for the stimulated north south versus vertical extents, the values are too similar to distinguish between different orientations. So um, you know, say in this in this plot here where we're looking north south versus vertical, you're seeing the colors sort of segregated. Oh, purples here, greens here, blues here. Um, does that mean there's a significant pattern based on this orientation? Um, the answer is no, because these are all pretty much the same. You can't you you wouldn't you wouldn't divide these up into different groups other than these three that are behaving differently over here, which we talked about. I won't I won't spend much time with these next couple of slides, but um, you can see in the paper I do the same thing plotting up if we're just interested in those fractures that actually take fluid. So those that are actually inflating or dilating as opposed to those that might be failing in shear as well. We can look for the same kinds of patterns, so we're plotting here just the extent of inflation in three directions. So. Um, The, um, the inflation does not seem to be as as sensitive to the stress conditions as were the full stimulation extents. So we're not seeing that that big pattern in the vertical inflation extents, the big difference between the blue and the green. It's not it's not it's not necessarily two different populations showing up here. Um, but we are seeing if you just look at the length of the whiskers, we are seeing much more variability due to the DFN realization in, in when we have the lower SH min values than, than when we have the higher SH min values with a couple of exceptions here. But these all have quite high variability. Um, and that's and those are the ones with the minimum SH min gradients. And just a sort of a reminder here about uh, what I showed earlier is that uh, with the normal stress regime, inflated fractures tend to be subvertical, while fractures experiencing shear failure tend to be more inclined. Just referring back to those uh, stereo nets where I was showing inflation and um, uh, the dilation and slip tendencies. So, so this is mainly looking at those the the vertical fractures in the system and how they're responding. And this is the same plot of the inflation extents again, just looking at the anisotropy. And I say, while well, there appears to be a pattern in the ratios of extents due to the stress conditions for two of these three figures, it's not controlled by the magnitude of SH min. Just saying we're color coding these based on the SH min gradient. You're not really seeing patterns that follow that color coding system. All right, so we have some conclusions from that work. Um, and we can say with, with I think, quite a lot of confidence that the stimulation in the east-west direction is consistently smaller than in the north-south or vertical directions. And the north-south stimulation extent is generally very similar to the vertical extent, with a couple of exceptions there. And that the inflation of fractures is not as sensitive to the stress condition as slip is. And then on to kind of the purpose of of this work is really was really to identify some DFN realizations which might be more interesting to pursue with more detailed and full physics simulations. Which ones of those 30 stochastic realizations, which ones should we use? You, you know, we can't we, we can't necessarily do all of them. Which one should we pick for further work? 
Um, so depends on what question you're asking, but if your question is what will be the vertical extent of stimulation, we can look at these results here. And if you want sort of uh, the most likely, so we have the most likely stress conditions, the most average performing one, we can say it was this uh, realization 20. Like this would be a very nice candidate to pass on for future work. But if you said, well, I'm I'm more concerned. I want to know about extreme values. It's really important to me to know, our, you know, what's the, you know, give me an ex the the one that will extend the most. Well, then I could say, well, the ones that that are showing the most vertical extension um, is is this realization, the DFN number 17, but only for this stress condition. So the North 25 East, the recommended. SH max gradient, but the minimum SH min gradient. And that one is showing the, the largest vertical extent. And likewise, the smallest vertical extent is this case here. So it's realization number 30. And um, the direction for the for the stress conditions where the stress is north 40 east, the minimum SH max gradient and the recommended SH min gradient. So that gave you sort of the minimum. So um, those are three different DFNs that would give you very different results, and you might want to pick one of them for future work. Which leads me to how we can share can share these DFNs with mo other modelers, both within our team and with the external community. This is the slide that I showed previously where um, you need to really uh, first ask yourself, what's the question you're trying to address? And are you working in 3D or 2D? So there's, um, you know, do you want the actual discrete fractures or, or are you working in a continuum model where you just want upscaled fractures? So um, there are many questions to, to be asked before you say, which, which DFN do I want and, and uh, what subset perhaps do I need of it? I'll go through an example here. So one of my colleagues is doing some 2D modeling and 2D modeling of this of this question of stimulation right at the toe of this well 16A. You can see it here. And um, she wanted me to give her some starting natural fractures for her work. So um, if I put a vertical slice in my model that aligns with with the orientation of this well, and um, and look at the region in sort of in the square square about 1400 meters by 1400 meters. There are 46,000 fractures in my DFN that intersect that 2D slice. And that is too many for her to work with. So the question is, well, what kind of filtering should we do on that fracture set to give her meaningful results at the end to work with? So for one, since she's working in 2D, we can choose fractures that have particular orientations, those that are uh, more uh, orthogonal to this to this 2D slice. So, so just choosing the ones that have pole vectors within 20 degrees of being orthogonal to the plane, are, um, we sort of first do a filter on that. And that reduced the number by half. So now we have about 23,000 fractures, still too many. So another thing we can very reasonably do is um, to do some extra filtering by size and location. So, um, this is a pretty big region, 1400 meters by 1400 meters. Certainly we're very interested in what's happening right at the, the open hole section, right at the stimulation point. We really would like to capture all the fractures that are in that location. So we put a box, a 50 meter box around that area. And we're saying within that box, we want all, all the fracture traces. So, um, so keep, keep everything there. But then as we move further away from the zone, we're saying, well, we don't need all the fractures. We don't need maybe the smallest ones. The larger ones will be more important. Let's do a filter by size there. So within this sort of medium sized box, we're only taking fractures above uh, a certain size range. And then beyond that medium sized box for the rest of the fractures, just take the very largest ones. So um, filtering that way, allows us to greatly reduce the numbers and now that leaves about 800 traces in this region 
which is a, a reasonable number for her to work with. So for your work, um, if you want if you want these, you know, think about what questions you have. Um, what what are you trying to answer? Uh, are you are you stimulating the pilot well? Are you stimulating the new well? Like where where is your area of concern? Um, are you doing discrete or continuum modeling? So do you want the discrete fractures or would you like um, them upscaled? 2D or 3D? You know, what's your modeling region? Um, do you want your fractures pre or post stimulated? So um, for some people, I can I can identify which fractures are probably most likely to be inflated or sheared and select those and not not pass on the fractures that are probably more stable given their particular orientation. Is there a num is there a maximum number of fractures that you need? Um, should we be filtering these these DF, these DFNs by size, orientation, location, and what format would you like them in? So, if you want continual modeling, do you have an upscaling grid available? Um, and what properties do you need? You know, porosity and directional permeability are the most common ones, but there are others that we can do as well. So, we would like to share this reference DFN and, and the work that we've done in identifying identifying particular DFNs for particular purposes with the greater community. We're going to make these available on the GDR for everybody to access. And um, so if you if you would like one of these DFNs, contact us, please um, send email to this uh, Utah Forge modeling at utah.edu site and <clears throat> and uh, don't bother contacting me personally because um, uh, I can't provide custom DFNs for you. But um, if you if you pass your question on here, it'll get sent to me, and uh, we can uh, if we get re requests that we think are reasonable, we can make them available to everybody. So um, as we make these available, they'll be posted on the on the GDR, and also we'll publicize them on the numerical modeling page on the Forge website here. Well, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, we did have some questions following the original talk, so um, I will address those next. Let me stop sharing my screen so I can read those. All right, and here are some of the questions that we received and I won't we don't have we didn't record our exact answers to them we but um, I will I will do my best to to do so all right so one question was do you have a scenario of stimulation without existing natural fractures as the 5832 well section in the zone 3 upper perforation for uh, an unsuccessful stimulation conducted in 2019? The answer to that is no. Uh, no, we don't have a, a simulation of that. However, there was an analysis of the one natural fracture present in zone three to predict breakdown pressure. And actually, that's the one I show in the in the slide deck here as my example, where it had the um, the dilation and slip tendencies and the Moore circle. Um, there has been significant modeling work done in the stimulation of zone two, however, so there would be something for you there if that's if that's of interest. Here's another question. What are the criteria for flak, frac fluid selection type, rate and material properties here? And have you studied how this selection will change your final optimized model? Um, and the answer is um, this this work is not examining the frac fluids. Uh, the focus is on sensitivity to stress directions and magnitude, but we as a team are currently developing a stimulation plan for the the toe of the well, which is examining frac fluid properties. So that is work that is uh, in progress. Uh, here's a question. Does the stimulation plan assume propent and propent flow gravity settling? And um, so uh, the use of propent isn't a, for, isn't a foregone conclusion. 
The initial stimulations will be carried out by the FORGE team and are intended to gather data to share with the community. We have propent, viscous fires, gels in, in a matrix of things to consider. So we may not model all possible stimulation scenarios, but some will likely be eliminated due to risk or permitting considerations. So that is, again, it's a sort of ongoing work. It wasn't covered, wasn't covered in what I presented here, but that is something that's that's being looked at. Uh, here's a question. What are the main weaknesses of this modeling work? And I'd say to that any modeling work should be designed with a particular question in mind. So this work is trying to find representative DFNs for running hydraulic fracture simulations at the toe of the new well. It is exploring the sensitivity of the DFN to the starting seed and hence the particular DFN realization and the regional stress state. So uh, some assumptions are made regarding the maximum stimulated fracture aperture width and pressure dissipation with distance along the fracture network as I mentioned and these control how far the stimulation stimulated zone extends so if these assumptions are wrong then we might not be testing the correct volume of the reservoir for a given injection period so we might be looking at too small a volume or or too large a volume and either of those cases it's it's going to change the results to some extent um, I will say that there's some feedback here that once we get more information about uh, from the full full physics models, they can feed back into those assumptions. We could rerun sort of this work with some better assumptions too. So um, I'd say it's um, it's is good for the first round, but further work could be done to to do uh, more precise and perhaps more quantitative work on it. All right. Here's a question. Will this approach uh, for, uh, oh, does this approach include stress shadowing between adjacent hydraulic frac stages? So, um, you know, this sort of the simplified hydraulic fracturing simulation performed here for the sensitivity work based on stochastic realization and stress did, did not include the stress shadowing effects. Now, FRACMAN and other codes are certainly capable of including this effect, but it takes more computational resources, so you probably would not do that work on hundreds of simulations like was done here. You would take one or two of the pre-screen DFNs from this work and do more detailed simulations on those. So this is kind of a first step. Um, you know, at this stage, we're just discussing characterizing the existing natural fractures, and once these are embedded into numerical models. We can do stress shadowing, stress shadowing of um, simulations as well. All right, here's another question. How can we extend the outcrop based power law distribution to subsurface DFN distributions? Well, once the power law exponent is determined, then this plus a minimum size can be used to generate the fracture sizes in the DFN. They are randomly assigned sizes from this defined power law distribution during generation. So it's actually pretty straightforward given how at least uh, Frackman creates this DFN. <clears throat> All right, uh, fracture aperture has no relationship with depth, but to fracture orientation with respect to stress azimuth. How do you explain this? You showed a relationship to calculate aperture from depth. So um, not really. Uh, the, the initial apertures were assigned using a relationship with fracture size, not depth. So depth didn't come into that at all. And um, you know, stimulated fractures were identified, but their stimulated apertures were not reported here. So um, yeah, we, we're, we're just assigning a relationship with size, not depth. And here's this last question. What kind of distribution have you used for the fracture set hydraulic properties aperture, like aperture or strength properties like uh, friction coefficient? So uh, as there is a slide in that I showed here that shows the aperture uh, was assumed to be proportional to the square root of the fracture size. And since the fracture size is generated from a truncated power law distribution, the aperture turns out to have a log normal distribution. Uh, and the fracture, the friction coefficient was constant. But you know, you should be aware we're not the 
it's not like we have a totally distinct aperture distribution from size distribution. They're they're linked. So the largest fractures have the largest apertures and vice versa. All right, and um, that was all we covered. Um, thank you for your time and I hope you join us for future forum talks. Thank you very much.